Hello, good afternoon, good evening, and good morning to everyone joining today's weekly um, live Q&A on COVID-19. Uh, the subject of today's session is uh, post-COVID condition or so-called long COVID. Uh, so I'm pleased to be joined by Dr. Maria Van Kirkov and Dr. Jana Diaz, who is our expert, clinical expert on the response of COVID-19, but also working with uh, long COVID groups and, and patients. Uh, so please, if you're watching us on Twitter, use the hashtag AskWHO to send your questions. Or if you're watching us on other platforms, please um, use the comment section and I will pass your questions to Maria and uh, Janet. Um, maybe actually uh, we can start, Maria, with um, an update on mortality rates because last Friday we were talking about that tragic milestone of 1 million deaths being reported from COVID-19 in 2022 so far. Uh, so do we see any improvement and decrease in rates in, in the past week? So thanks, Alex, for having both of us. And thanks for making this session today on post-COVID-19 condition. This is a really important topic for us. So we're very happy to be here to focus on that. But I will give a general overview of sort of where we are um, within the case reports and the death reports that we've had. So. You know, we are seeing a decline in cases being reported, which is a good sign. However, we do know, again, that surveillance capacities have declined, um, testing policies have changed, um, and we're not seeing what we believe are the actual numbers of cases that are occurring being reported to WHO because there's more self-testing. Um, so that's, we have to take the trends into account when we look at cases. Unfortunately, with deaths, we are actually seeing an increase this last week. So we've seen an 8% increase in the last seven days. Over the month, we've seen a decline. So if you look at our epi curve and you look at this black line that's tracking deaths, you will see a decline um, in those deaths. But in the last week, 63,102 people died from COVID-19. Three years into this pandemic, when we have tools to prevent them is, as we talked about last week, not only tragic, but these are largely preventable because we have access to diagnostics, we have access to earlier clinical care, we have trained health workers that have experience with COVID-19, and we have safe and effective vaccines that work against these variants that are circulating and that have been circulating for, for several years now. So it's not a, a good situation that, that we want to be in. The Euro had their press conference today and they talked about the situation that they're in. They're gonna be reaching 250 million cases you know, in the coming weeks. Um, they've seen a decline in cases and a decline in deaths, but we've seen an increase in deaths of 86% in the Western Pacific. We've seen an increase in deaths of 30% in the Southeast Asian region. Um, and we've seen an increase in deaths of 62% in the Eastern Mediterranean region. And so when we look, obviously it's a mixed picture around the world, but we are seeing countries in very different situations. They've had different waves of infection. And in particular with Omicron, which is the variant, the dominant variant concern, and I know we'll come to this a little bit later, some countries have seen waves of Omicron infection from the different subvariants, BA.1, BA.2, now BA.5 is dominant. And among people who are not vaccinated, not fully vaccinated, there is an increased risk of needing hospitalization and there's an increased risk of death. And this is what we are seeing consistently, that the proportion of people who are dying are largely people who have not been vaccinated, not been reached with vaccination, or they have not received that full course. So one of the big takeaway messages that we have here is vaccination is saving lives. Vaccination is preventing severe disease. And you'll hear more about the effect of vaccination on long COVID from Janet in a little bit. But vac vaccines work. Um, and what we need to do is we need to reach all of those in country who've been missed, especially those who are at risk for severe disease. So it's a mixed picture. And unfortunately, you know, again, you know, we're seeing this, this increase in, in death. I made a mistake in my reporting of the numbers, I'm sorry. So the 63,102 deaths were in the last 28 days, not in the last seven days. I apologize for that mistake there. But we did see 13,000 people, 541, 13,541 people die in the last week. That's far too many. So let's not become numb to these numbers. Let's, let's talk about this and let's you know, use the, the positive aspects that we actually have tools that can prevent these from happening. So we are optimistic that we can change the course of this. Live our lives, live with COVID responsibly, go about our daily lives, but do it responsibly and do it safely. Thank you so 
so much, Maria, and uh, for, again, walking us through different situations uh, in different regions. Um, and as you said, uh, almost 14,000 people, again, died in the past week. And these numbers are, are still shocking. And we're also uh, seeing some reports, Janet, I, I think we saw somewhere in the news that uh, it, there is an estimate that 4 million people are living with post-COVID condition. So do you know um, if, the, if this estimate is correct? Can we at all make an estimate on how many people are suffering from so-called long COVID? So thank you, and it's also my pleasure to be here with you uh, and with Maria. Gosh, making the estimate is complicated, um, but there is a, a recent uh, report that was um, that is publicly available. It's not been peer reviewed, but it's uh, a report by the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation. And this group is, um, has done lots of work on trying to understand the burden of disease. What is the total estimate of cases for different types of diseases and conditions? And they did focus on post COVID-19 condition, also known as long COVID. And they made very worrisome estimates from data that they looked at in 2020 and 2021. And those estimates were about that 144 million people um, were affected with post-COVID-19 condition with long COVID. So that's a big number. The reason it's so big is because the, actually the estimates of total cases is quite big. Um, you know, and Maria can, and can tell us more about that, but it's you know, much more higher than we know because not everyone has been tested um, for, post, for uh, COVID-19. So with this 144 million, uh, that's about, they're estimating 4% of infected cases. Uh, people who have had COVID-19 have developed long COVID. So could I just comment on that? Because I think it's important what Janet was saying there is, you know, we as WHO have cases that are reported to us through surveillance activities. And this largely comes from PCR testing. So you've seen um, in our dashboard, we have cumulative cases of 598 million confirmed cases reported to WHO. But in fact, the estimate of infections is much higher than that. And we know that from our seroprevalence studies. So that estimates antibodies and people who have been infected in the past. And this was even before vaccination was rolled out. Um, and in some of those estimates of seroprevalence, or measuring the antibodies in the blood, are upwards of 60, 70, 80%, 90% in some places, even before vaccination was rolled out. So what those estimates of long COVID take into account are the unrecognized cases, people that may have not gone to seek health care, people that may have not had a PCR test, and even now may be doing self-testing. So that number, that 4% of the infections, you know, more than 100 million, you said 144 million mm -hmm people estimated to be impacted by post-COVID-19 condition is a large number because this virus circulates at such an intense level. So that's where that basis is coming. And Alex, would you just permit me to just correct those numbers? Because I'm just Please worried that I didn't say this correctly on the deaths. And I just want to um, say this correctly. So in the last seven days, we saw more than 13,000 people die from COVID-19 reported to WHO. That's a decline from the week before, but that's still a large number of deaths. And over the last 28 days, so the last month, we saw 63,102 people die. And that's an 8% increase over the month. And so I just wanted to correct those numbers in case anyone was confused by what I had said previously. Thank you so much, Maria. And um, speaking about post-COVID condition and estimates, also not everyone suffers the same from those, this post-COVID condition. So maybe we can also remind our viewers what are the symptoms and signs of post-COVID conditions, so how they can recognize it, and also how they can seek care if they, they feel they need support. So, if you've had COVID-19 and your symptoms have not gotten better, if you haven't fully recovered after about three months is what we put in our case definition, but it's not so strict, you know. Some people may get it before then, some people may present later, but after three months, if your symptoms have not improved or gone away, or you've developed a new symptom, then that is the trigger to seek care. Again, maybe you don't wanna wait three months and you're worried about your symptom, then go get care sooner. So I think that's number one. Number two is symptoms. What symptoms are common? The symptoms, um, sometimes people develop shortness of breath is one of the three clusters. And again, from that previous study, they looked at three clusters of symptoms. So symptoms around breathing, mm -hmm. so trouble breathing, symptoms around cognitive dysfunction or brain fog, which was um, 
which is how it's commonly described, and symptoms around fatigue. Now, those are the three kind of major symptom clusters, but that's not all-inclusive. There are many other symptoms that have been described, maybe related around that, such as uh, chest pain, such as uh, loss of taste and smell, but those are kind of the three major symptoms. But if you have a symptom that you're concerned about and it's been lingering and not getting better um, or something new and you don't know what it is and it's one of those or maybe another one, then seek care. Seeking care then means that you can get evaluation with, a, um, with your primary care provider. We don't know, you know, the care system's kind of dependent on how the healthcare system is set up where you live. So in some places, that means you go to your primary care provider and they can see you. They will ask you questions about how long you've had your symptoms, how severe are your symptoms, and are the symptoms impacting your daily function? And that's actually a key because if you can't do what you usually do every day, then, then we need to see how we can get you better. Mm -hmm. And so your doctor um, or you know, your healthcare provider can do an evaluation, an assessment, and then decide if you need special tests. There are sometimes special tests that need to be done for people, especially if you have something like shortness of breath. They need to make sure that your lungs are okay. They need to make sure that your heart is okay. So they may send you for some tests. Other things, if you have some uh, cognitive dysfunction or brain function, they will do maybe some neurological tests, depending on what type of symptom you have. And then people may need to go see a specialist, but that shouldn't be that you go to your specialist on your own, that maybe go to your primary care provider, let them coordinate, have a coordinated care pathway. So maybe you need to go to a specialist or you need to go to a rehab specialist, right? Because the rehab interventions can be very helpful or you need to go to a mental health, you know, and or you need to go to a mental health specialist or to seek care with a social worker. So this multidisciplinary type of care is really good to ensure that you get your symptoms dealt with and the right evaluation at the right time. Thank you so much, Janet. And I think you responded questions from few viewers here, but I think some of them are actually experiencing some of those symptoms. So I do want to acknowledge as this is not uh, easy. Uh, Candace Burns is uh, saying that um, she had COVID in June 2022, but still have days when she's fatigued and hard to get anything done. As you said, this is maybe the hardest when you can't go back to your daily activities. Um, Glides Baker was asking what are the long COVID effects, and I, I think you were talking about symptoms. And there was a question from Nikita Toshi about neurological problems in particular. Um, and what are the different conditions that have been reported? So I think before, um, I want to give reassurance to those that have said, you know, someone who's had, who had, was diagnosed in June, now we are a couple months after that. Again, this is the right time to kind of be thinking, do, may I have, you know, do I have long COVID? Should I seek care? Um, you know, what is my symptom really like? And talk to, talk to your doctor about that. So I think that's really important. I also wanted to give the information from that study I quoted before, the duration of symptoms, um, it's not, it doesn't have to be super long. So it, we do know the majority of people get better. And we, we, we know that there's a, it's a proportion in that study, only 15%, which is still a significant number when we talk about millions. So, mm -hmm. so let's remember that because they're talking, the scale is so big, but it's a small proportion of patients that continue to have symptoms at one year. And for those that had mild disease to begin with, non-severe disease who developed post-COVID, the duration, kind of the average, what was reported is about four months, and then it went away. So that's good. And those that had severe COVID at the beginning, the, the duration may be longer of the long COVID, maybe up to nine months. Um, but we do know, I want to be, re I want to give the reassurance though, um, that uh, cases, patients do get better. The symptoms can go away. Um, but getting care um, and seeking uh, coordinated care is, is quite important. For the neurological symptoms, I think it's been about, you know, difficult concentration, uh, difficult uh, sleeping, um, then a little bit more of the typical ones that people had with COVID is loss of taste, loss of smell. And um, there's also been descriptions of um, people getting dizzy, um, when they stand up, so something a little bit with part of the uh, neurological symptoms that keeps you from not getting dizzy when you go from sitting to standing or laying down to sitting up. But, um, but those have been described, and so the clinicians and hopefully the doctors that are, you know, and the, the staff, the nurses that are taking care of you and the rehab intervention, uh, rehab specialists can address those symptoms and work with you to, to cope with those symptoms to keep you um, functional and active. 
Thank you. Can I may I comment? Please. So I, I just wanted to comment on, I think these are, it's great that we have um, people that are watching that are asking questions directly because we know that there are a lot of people out there that have a lot of questions. And I just wanted to, to acknowledge the work that we've, we've been trying to do as best we can with the patient groups that are out there. So Janet's team, as you know, works with clinicians and, and so many different clinicians. So one point is, Janet, you've pointed out that it's it's multi-system, right? It's this comprehensive approach in, in dealing with a patient, wherever they may be in the course of their disease disease from early onset, even prevention, early onset, all the way through post-COVID-19 care. It's a comprehensive approach. Assess the patient, get them into the clinical care with their primary care physician, and then see that specialized care that's necessary. But the patient groups that, that came to us that said, look, please, this is something that is real. We want recognition. We want research. We want rehab. And these are major areas of work that WHO is working on to advance this. And I know it can be frustrating that we don't have all the answers. And clearly, we don't. We still don't. This virus is still not, it's still surprising us. And one of the things Janet has highlighted, and I just want to emphasize, is these studies. So what we need, we talk about a case definition. It's important that we look at the case definition. Is it fit for purpose? You know, what, what is the range of signs and symptoms and what is the duration and what does this look like in terms of post-COVID-19 and who is most effective? A lot of this comes from these studies because we need well-characterized data coming from lots of different sources, many different countries, not just high-income countries, from adults, from children, you know, well-characterized. And we have clinical um, data collection systems for post-COVID-19 condition to be able to assess that so that the answers that are given are more comprehensive. And so that the rehab, the clinical care that Janet's teams works on is developed. And I know you just issued some, some guidance, so you will be issuing updated guidance on that as well soon is more evidence-based, if you will, so that we could provide our member states and clinicians and doctors and nurses with the best advice that they can to provide the care that's needed. It's an ongoing process. We don't have all those answers yet. So I think that was the other thing I just wanted to emphasize. Mm -hmm. But it's, that's not good enough. And I know that out there that that's not good enough. What I want to reassure and what Janet has said, most people do get better. But I also want to reassure you that this is not something that we will forget about. This is something that we have committed to working on and committed to working on with many different technical disciplines, many different medical professionals to be able to provide that appropriate care in the short, in the medium, and in the long term. And we are asking governments to invest in this, to plan for post-COVID-19 condition within their populations because this will require investment. This will, inf this will require um, the infrastructure the workforce at that primary care level and that specialized care. Um, and that's something that, that WHO is committed to. And I, I do want to thank Janet and her team for working so hard on this and for convening the world's expertise on this because we're all learning. Thank you so much, Maria. And there is a comment from someone who has the impression that we are not doing enough to uh, support patients who are suffering from post-COVID mm. conditions. So uh, I'm glad that you mentioned that we are working with patients groups and, and I hope as well that our colleagues in regions are um, mm -hmm. doing the same in, in multiple countries and, and listening their needs and, and concerns. Um, we are receiving more questions on particular symptoms of, of post-COVID condition, but maybe, Janet, before we go in, into that, is to address who is more vulnerable to develop long COVID or post-COVID condition, and what do we know about children? So it seems from the from what we know so far um, that it is more common in women than in men. It is more common in adults than in children. So the children can get long COVID. And we actually had a webinar mm. last week, and it's on the internet, it's on the web, mm -hmm. all the presentations are there. So you please, mm -hmm. please look at our website and look at that. You can get the most up-to-date information. But the risk, um, it looks like children are less affected. It's less common in children, but more and more so in, in, um, in adults. Aside from that, it does seem that it's uh, more, pa uh, more affects patients who've had severe COVID than those that have had mild COVID. But in absolute numbers, again, we have to look mm -hmm. at the absolute numbers here because it's much more common to have mild or non-severe COVID. The, the, the number of patients affected in absolute numbers is, is bigger in the non-severe group. And that I remember mm -hmm. from the beginning, everyone's like, no, it's not the severe group getting it, it's the non-severe group. And that is true um, in absolute numbers. Um, so so that's, how, that's what it's looking mm -hmm. like uh, right, right now um, from what we know. And speaking about children and how they are affected, um, 
does it also start like longer than three months, as you mentioned? And it's a great question. So, um, you know, we've been looking at it. That's why we had that webinar last week, because we needed to see what's the information, what's the studies, like uh, Maria was talking about. What is what do we what have we learned about it in children? And we've um, and I, it, it's still information we're processing. But in September, on the 12th or the 13th of September, we're actually convening an expert panel of clinicians and experts, pediat pediatricians, pediatric rehab specialists, um, pediatric uh, neurologists, special and developmental experts in, in pediatric medicine. And we are going to convene them to adapt the definition for children. So mm -hmm. some of the things we're looking at is the symptoms, mm -hmm. right? Because the symptoms in children may not be the same symptoms as they are in adults. So they may be a little bit different. It's also how do you assess that in a very small child versus, you know, a, an older child versus an adolescent, which may mm -hmm. be more, more like an adult in mm -hmm. their symptoms. So we are carefully looking at this. So uh, we do hope that that new case definition for children will be published uh, in October, but the meeting is, is upcoming very soon. Um, and I also wanted just to make the estimate, a lot of what, you know, be, and it builds on what Maria said. Some of the information we have now is actually from studies that were done in 2020 or 2021. Mm -hmm. That was before Omicron, mm -hmm. and that was before vaccines were available where they are now, and also um, before you know treatments were being used for the acute phase. So, um, so that absolute number, that absolute estimate of what we're going to see now, what we will see in the future, um, still remains, uh, you know, something that we still need to understand. But the emphasis to um, to do good observational, controlled, you know, studies mm -hmm. to assess, um, mm -hmm. to get these case definitions used all around the world, so that people are talking the same thing, which is really nice when the IHME group used, you know, the WHO case definition mm -hmm. in their report because that really spoke clearly of what we're talking about what that report is telling us. Thank you so much, Janet. And uh, Maria, also one of our viewers is asking if you have uh, long COVID for a year, uh, does that mean, with, and you have COVID symptoms for a longer period, does it mean that you are all the time po positive for COVID-19 and can infect others? So that's a great question, which I'm going to pass to Janet. But, um, okay, you know, sorry. We, have, we have seen, we do look at the infectiousness of patients. Um, and we do look for how long typically people are uh, infectious with the virus and where the virus is replicating in, in their body. And it does depend on um, age. It does depend on the type of s severity that you may have. People who are asymptomatic versus those that have very few symptoms versus those who have been vaccinated or not. Number of vaccines that you have had or have been boosted, your age, your underlying conditions, etc., and if you're immunocompromised. Um, we do know that people who are immunocompromised can be infectious for quite long periods of time. And there have been some studies that have looked at, you know, several hundred days, in fact, for some individuals. But typically, you know, people are most infectious around the time, around the time that they develop symptoms. And it, and it t and tends to tail off within eight or nine days if you had mild disease. And as far as I know, in terms of the data that we've had, it can be longer up to three weeks Four weeks if you have severe disease, but if you're immunocompromised, it can be longer than that. Now, I, I give a general overview of that, but it also depends on the variants. So there are variants that have been circulating, as you know, we've had alpha, beta, gamma, delta. Um, now we have Omicron, and we have subvariants of Omicron, and we have subvariants of subvariants of Omicron. The virus is evolving. So every time we get an answer on infectiousness, we have to evaluate it again. What is the data that we have on studies that are that are being ongoing? But this is something that we constantly look at because this has implications for our recommendations for isolation because we still are recommending to reduce the spread of this virus. You know, we're not only focusing on reducing morbidity, mortality, the risk of, of post-COVID-19 condition, but we also want to reduce the spread. And so the infectiousness has, has an impact on that. I'm going to pass to you on the infectiousness among long COVID patients. So it's important for for long COVID um, that to make the di you know to make the diagnosis to consider this as a diagnosis in a patient um, is that you've had a history of COVID nineteen the acute illness mm -hmm. and during that illness is when if you got a test mm -hmm. you would be positive. Mm -hmm. For the long COVID, now we're saying you've had symptoms for more than three months. Um, we it's not, we don't have a diagnostic test for long COVID, and that is actually one of the major things that we need to accelerate our understanding of what mm -hmm. kind of test would be helpful. It's not a PCR test mm -hmm. because these patients, you are not infectious with post-COVID-19 mm -hmm. condition. 
So, so I would kind of disaggregate mm -hmm. that you are infectious, like Maria spoke about during the acute illness, as she already described, but during the post-COVID illness, um, uh, not infectious. But I want to give a caveat to that. One, it's a caveat, it's about the mechanism, like what's causing the post-COVID-19 condition. And that's accelerating our understanding. We are learning more. And I think in December, but I don't want to say exactly the date, we will have a webinar where we, um, which is our main way of sharing information. That's mm -hmm. actually what we're doing quite often is to have this webinar series. We can disseminate the information that is coming out in some sort of, um, you know, uh, organized fashion. Public. Uh, publicly yeah. for mm -hmm. all people to, mm -hmm. to listen. But... Um, What's the mechanism? So there are some hypotheses. One is that the virus is persisting somewhere in the body, mm -hmm. and maybe that's what's causing a continued um, inflammatory response, like your body has, has revved up and it's, it's having that a little bit of inflammation, which is causing some of these symptoms in, um, in your brain, your symptoms uh, in your lungs. So, so that's a hypothesis, um, but it doesn't mean that you're infectious with the virus, right. and I just want to be clear with that. Um, the other hypothesis is this inflammation, that is just your body still reacting in a residual way to the virus you had before. Another one is um, clotting. So we do know clotting during the acute illness is a big com is a complication. Mm -hmm. um, and then was there also some clotting or small clots, you know, microthrombi that's causing some of these lingering um, symptoms. Uh, you know, we also know patients after an acute illness, uh, there are reports now that patients um, uh, have more cardiac complications, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, have had more heart attacks or cardiovascular complications um, in that first year after uh, an acute, the acute illness, especially those who are, who are, who are more sick uh, with the acute illness. So, so there's still lots to disentangle. Uh, also diabetes, that mm -hmm. patients have been diagnosed with diabetes after the acute illness. Did they have it before and it wasn't diagnosed and now it's diagnosed? You know, there's still things to sort out, but that's what we've been seeing. So good care in that, uh, you know, good self-care and uh, good care with your clinician in that first year after your acute illness is really important um, to get yourself back to good health. Thank you. One oh, of the re I, just, I just want to come back to this because, you know, a lot of people, I hear a lot of people saying, look, you know, COVID is just something we're going to have to deal with. Just, you know, please stop talking about COVID. You know, we, we need to move on. We need to live our lives. Just please stop. And we just can't do that. And the reason that we can't do that is not only is COVID, you know, causing severe disease and killing people, which we can prevent with the tools that we have. It's also having this unknown massive impact on people that are suffering from what we're calling post-COVID-19 condition, which we're beginning to learn about. A lot of people think, you know, it's just you know, a one-off one infection, you have your disease and you get better. And for many people, that's the case. But in a proportion of people who have been infected, which we are learning about, which we can only estimate, they're having these longer term effects, which we're finally trying to understand and we're finally learning more and more information. But as Janet has just said, there's many more hypotheses than we have answers to. Although there are many incredible people around the world that are working on that. And thank you to all of you who are doing research in this area. But this is why we continue to fight and push to end this emergency of COVID-19. We have to reduce the spread because the virus is circulating. We don't have people who are vaccinated um, in large parts of the world. The DG had, had it, it announced in his press conference last week that there are billions of people that have not been fully infected, have fully been vaccinated, mm -hmm. you know, and largely in low income countries, mainly among older people. And so there's a lot that we need to do because long COVID, post COVID-19 condition is one of the things that we are going to have to be dealing with in the long term. So there's a lot of reasons why we need to still um, maintain systems for COVID-19. We need to integrate these systems into primary care, into the into the care that we give people who, for wherever they show up within their, their health care facilities. Um, we need to maintain surveillance. We need to maintain sequencing. We need to invest in our workforce. We need to invest in research because this is something that we will have to deal with. And dealing with COVID is actually preparing for dealing with now and for the future. So it's an investment in, in systems, in this global health architecture that we need. And so this is another reason to invest in that. And I'm pleading here to our member states and I'm pleading here to our governments and to our funders to continue to finance these types of studies, this type of work, because you know mm -hmm. there's just a lot more work to do. Thank you, Maria. And maybe uh, I will take some questions that um, actually our viewers mentioned speaking about um, 
investment resources preparedness. Um, one of the, the viewers was saying that health workers aren't necessarily very supportive where the person is coming from when it comes to post-COVID condition. So one thing may be the uh, lack of information and training on how to deal mm -hmm. with the post-COVID condition. Um, and then there was another question uh, from people who said that uh, the husband of the person needs uh, support for his post-COVID condition, but they can't afford it. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe we can address those issues and how we are trying to work with countries to ensure first that the health workforce is trained uh, to support patients uh, who are suffering from long COVID, but also to ensure affordability of care and access to needed care. So it's um, it's a complex question. I think we try to tackle it in many different ways at the same time. Um, one is uh, developing norms and standards for clinical care. So we do have clinical management guidelines, and that's meant to empower um, clinicians, healthcare providers to know what to do, right? What do I do? Which drug do I give? What's the intervention? You know, and, the, and so we have the living guideline, the living COVID-19 guideline, and that one focuses on therapeutics for acute COVID-19, the other one on clinical care. And in the clinical care one, we have... Um, a chapter now that's growing on the management of patients after the acute illness and for post-COVID-19 conditions. So that's one of the things we do because we have to um, translate evidence into policy. So what, what, what does what does what do I need to do when I take care? How do I diagnose? How, what do I do? What are the interventions that uh, will help the patient feel better? So in the next guideline update, which I do hope is in a couple of weeks, but we haven't released it yet, we will have a new chapter that's focusing on the rehab interventions for post-COVID-19 condition. So that was developed with our rehab uh, colleagues here within WHO, the rehab unit, and um, is going to be a really useful, I think, set of uh, recommendations for clinicians and rehab professionals to use uh, as they do evaluations and interventions with patients with post-COVID-19 condition. The second thing that we do is try to disseminate, again, through these mm -hmm. webinars, we have to share information, and I'd like to call it peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. We just need to get the information here, to over there, patients hear it, families hear it, um, clinicians hear it, and then together we build um, more uh, knowledge about this. So again, the next webinar we will have will be at the end of the year on pathophysiology or mechanism, what's causing this. And the third thing is then supporting uh, research and in a way the what is necessary as maria said there is a, a, a missing active uh, clinical trials to assess treatments for long covid post covid 19 condition um, there's just not a lot out there mm -hmm. so remember all those trials that were done for mm -hmm. acute covid right for covid 19 mm -hmm. we had the you know we have three uh, antivirals that have been recommended by who we have uh, many immunomodulators also recommended by who for for covid 19 during the acute illness. For long COVID, we don't have that because the studies haven't been done, the treatments haven't been tested. Um, so there's some hypothesis of different types of treatments, but none of them are yet tested enough in a clinical trial. So why isn't that getting done? And I think Maria made a good call that I'll emphasize is we need funders to fund these trials, mm -hmm. these studies, because mm -hmm. people I think want to do them. You know, there's patients, there's clinicians, there's um, um, patient-led researcher research mm -hmm. movements uh you know that's what we um with our colleagues that are part of the patient advocacy groups you know so so there's a possibilities community-based research to do um to do studies uh and to uh to look at this but i do i am concerned that there's not enough interest you know shown uh to support financially also these studies through the donor community um uh for all that's um for all that can be done. And so when we want to update our guideline, I have to look to see what's been published. And if there's nothing that's been published, I can't, I can't write, I can't, I can't update right. the guideline. Right. So until then, we just do kind of the best practice information. So um, financing the health system, though, is, is another investment in the health system. And I think what we've all learned from COVID is that, you know, the health system, some of them greatly impact, have been greatly impacted by this. Mm -hmm. And it's not going away, right? So now it's like, how do we invest in the health system for to improve the care of COVID-19 during the acute phase, the acute illness, and, and to make sure that we can take care of those patients that develop this um, post-COVID-19 condition. And that includes health financing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, sustained, and of course, sustained, sustained health sustained. science and, and, you know, and, and WHO has always been working for universal health coverage. So it really emphasizes the need to have, um, yeah. have that. We, and we've seen some really interesting, I mean, I think we're also starting to see how countries are dealing, you know, in terms of these rehab centers and providing that care. I think I mentioned, you know, a, f- a few Q and A's back, a uh, recent trip that I made to Brazil, for example. Mm-hmm. And during that trip, I visited three post COVID-19 facilities. Mm-hmm. One was in a hospital, one was in a makeshift, it was an old school that was turned into a rehab center, and one was in a community. And there's novel approaches to how this is being done. And and what I was struck by, um, and maybe Janet, you know more about this, but what I was struck by was the comprehensive nature in which the delivery of the rehab or the care was provided. It was not just on for the lungs or for helping to walk again or for um, mental condition. It was, it was more comprehensive. And in the community one, for example, it was about the family coming in to say, we have been impacted by this. And I think part of the question was a husband or a family member and how do they support, how do they deal and how do they help that? Because it's confusing. There are the patient groups and I would advise to reach out to different patient groups because they have provided incredible support um, to those who are going through this to listen, to advocate, to speak out, you know, to express um, many different emotions and be really active and really productive. And I, and I commend them to doing so. But also how we deliver this and how countries and governments are going to deliver that care. That hasn't been worked out yet. Mm-hmm. What we do need is to see something that is sustained, that is part of the systems that Janet, as she mentioned, needs to be strengthened. Again, what we are doing for COVID and dealing with COVID is about strengthening systems. You know, we're using COVID as an an excuse, if you will, right? That's the trauma that we've all gone through. And many people want COVID to be over that we don't want to deal with it anymore, but we need to use this time to invest in those systems, strengthen them for what we need to deal with now and going forward. And part of that is long-term investment. Thank you so much, Maria. And uh, Janet, I would like to take a few more specific questions to uh, long COVID symptoms. Uh, Jean Hanna Wilson is, is saying that uh, he had COVID in April 2020 uh, and since has suffered j- uh, severe joint and muscle soreness and stiffness. Do you have any statistics on those long COVID symptoms? Uh, thanks for that question. That's a that's a long time. So so again, you know, like I said before, uh, unfortunately, there is a small proportion of patients that have persistent symptoms. Um, I don't have it on the soreness and the joint stiffness, to be honest, because it hasn't that doesn't necessarily get into the three major clusters. But not to say, you know, like I said, there's many symptoms that can be part of of long COVID. But I don't have that absolute that proportion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Another question is from a Twitter uh, viewer saying that a lot of patients that get diagnosed with post-COVID condition are told that the nervous vagus is compromised. How can they tell? Oh, okay. That may be a little bit, uh, it's quite a technical comment. Um, but again, the nervous system is separated in different parts. We have a central nervous system, like that's the brain. We have peripheral nerves that kind of is the sensation and kind of make the muscles work. Mm-hmm. And then we have an autonomic nervous system, which is the vagus is part of that is just make sure that the kind of inner workings of our organs are working Um, because the neurological um, uh, symptoms are varied you know brain fog we think is likely related to um, you know something more centrally in the brain um, potentially right and then these other symptoms like tingling um, may be related more to peripheral nerves this, there's something called um, dizziness, and dizziness sometimes, where because there's a control that you don't get dizzy when you when you're sitting up, laying down, standing up, you don't feel like you're going to lose your balance. So I don't know what the symptom is that you may have, um, but when it's dealing with some of these things that are controlled by the vagus nerve, it's possible. Um, and if that's part of the constellation of symptoms that you have, that um, that is related to post COVID nineteen condition. Thank you so much. We have a few more questions going back into nerve problems or symptoms and what are the most common long COVID symptoms. So maybe you can repeat that once again, because probably those you will join us later in the conversation. So um, again, the three major symptom clusters, you know, or symptoms areas is around uh, fatigue. So fatigue, Mm Again, I didn't. I didn't write this down, so I can't say the proportions. So I don't want to misspeak. Um, but fatigue is quite is is, is a common one, mm-hmm. right? People with extreme fatigue. The second, uh, and I'm not putting them in order because I don't have the proportions in my head. Uh, cognitive dysfunction or the brain fog, and that you know, 
can mean different things to different people, difficulty concentrating, difficulty sleeping, uh, uh, you know, difficulty kind of in thinking the way they were thinking before. And then um, uh, shortness of breath, and that is kind of trouble breathing, that their breathing has not normalized compared to what it was um, before. So those are the three, but again, there's a long list, and maybe I could also direct to the to the website. We are working to um, all the presentations from our webinar, so you can kind of start to look through that. But we are working on something very simplified to put on the web so that we can start to show you all the different types of symptoms that have mm -hmm. been described, including the co more common ones and also the ones that may be less common. But still, you know, the, what they have in common, though, is that they impact your everyday function, right? And that's actually what's what everyone, you know, what I'm, sh I'm sure is, is what's worrying everyone and what worries us, that it impacts your function, your everyday life. Thank you. We have all the same. We actually have that request from Jennifer Bada watching us on Facebook. Can we pro provide a list of all symptoms we are aware of, the common and less common ones? So you answer that as well. Um, and maybe before we close, here's a question from Skandia Berisha asking, what is the actual therapy used for COVID? So you mentioned that there are uh, some uh, uh, treatments that WHO is recommending. So maybe we can explain when these are used and, and how. Sure. So for COVID-19 during the acute illness, um, if you have non-severe disease and um, you are at a high risk, and uh, maybe I'll explain that in a s afterwards, mm -hmm. um, we have uh, recommendations for three different antivirals. We don't say to use them. Use one. You don't need to use all three at the same time. Um, but the options are nemaltrevir, ritonavir, also known as Paxlovid. Um, we have a strong recommendation for use for that. The other antiviral is called molnupiravir. And the third one is remdesivir. So those are the three ones. And when you use them early in disease, meaning, you know, in the first five days, you know, you have a symptom and you test and you're positive, then you get your prescription early, that if you use it early, that you have a reduced risk of getting hospitalized. So meaning your disease isn't getting worse. Now, this is most effective in patients who are at high risk because it's those patients that are at high risk, the ones that Maria was talking about before, um, that those high risk patients are the ones that are at risk for dying and those ones at risk for getting hospitalized. So if you don't, um, so the typical risk factors is someone who's older in age, someone who has a chronic disease, you know, such as diabetes or immunosuppressed, such as someone who's on, who has a malignancy or cancer or untreated HIV, and uh, or someone and someone who's been unvaccinated, so someone who's not vaccinated. So if you're really not vaccinated and you're a little bit older, then your risk, you have a risk of getting severe disease. You have risk of dying from COVID. Um, so these drugs really reduce that risk. They're very effective at reducing the risk. Um, but the absolute risk is, is the big bang for the buck. It, it, the, you know, give it to those patients, especially if you're in this group that I just described, that you need an early test and you need to um, take the treatment as soon as possible. And these treatment courses are relatively um, short courses of, of treatments. Two of them are oral antivirals, and one is an IV, so more complicated. So we are making a big effort, and I will say this here, because access to these has mm -hmm. been difficult. And so again, you know, WHO believes in um, equity and access. And, and so getting some of these drugs um, to countries uh, so they can get them into the clinical care pathways uh, has been a challenge. WHO and affordable. And affordable, right? We need affordable drugs. Mm -hmm. So it's a big piece of work WHO is doing with its many partners, you know, through the ACT-A mm -hmm. partnerships and, and whatnot. But um, really important that we do have mm -hmm. drugs that work, but they need to get to the right patient at the right time. For the patients who are hospitalized and have more severe disease and are on oxygen, um, we, we actually do have effective treatments for those patients as well, and we've had those for a while now. We have the corticosteroids that was at the beginning. It's widely available. It's a cheap uh, drug. Just need to know how to dose it and how to use it, and that's all on our websites because in our clinical websites, we do have mm -hmm. much information about these therapeutics. Um, then we have uh, two immunomodulators, um, also, they were used for other diseases before, um, repurposed for COVID, um, and one is called uh, interleukin-6 receptor antagonist, so something called tocilizumab, and the other um, is called baricitinib, which is another um, immunomodulator um, that works on the immune system. 
to tone down the immune system so it's not too um, hyperactive as it has been with uh, patients with severe and critical COVID-19. So again, used correctly, dosed correctly in the right patient, these actually reduce mortality. Mm -hmm. So those are available. Again, we've made some progress. Corticosteroids is available. The IL-6 tocilizumab, WHO has, has made some, we have made some strides in making that available around the world at a, at a good, at a fair price, um, but have struggled uh, with the other one. Thank you. I just want to add, because Janet has done this brilliant overview of the therapeutics that we have, and there are many, as you heard, for the full course of the disease. But I just want to also make a plug for vaccination. So what we want to do in as much as we can is prevent these infections in the first place, uh, prevent the opportunity for the virus to become severe. And our vaccines are working incredibly well. Um, it is still astonishing that we have so many safe and effective vaccines um, that are accessible. Uh, we have not reached vaccine equity around the world. We have not reached all of those that we need to reach, mm -hmm. but they work. And if you are offered a vaccine, if you are recommended to have mm -hmm. a primary series plus the booster or whatever is recommended for you, because it depends, it depends on your age, it depends on your underlying condition, it depends on the type of vaccine that you've had, um, get those recommended doses because those doses are preventing severe disease and there is some evidence to suggest that they have a positive effect against preventing post-COVID-19 condition. So it's an added benefit to that. Not only will it prevent you, save your life, but it could also prevent um, post-COVID-19 conditions. So please get vaccinated. And we, are, we have too many reports in too many countries of populations that are missed. We look at vaccination coverage at a population level, but we also look at vaccination coverage by at-risk groups, the ones Janet just described. People of older age, people with chronic conditions, people who are immunocompromised, our highly exposed individuals, mm -hmm. teachers, healthcare workers, et cetera, people, essential workers who are out there. We need vaccine coverage in those groups at 100%. Um, and, and we will not stop until that is reached. And we will work with all of our partners to deliver that. And many countries are taking great strides in that. But we have treatments for COVID-19. We have diagnostics that work. Getting into that clinical care pathway is absolutely critical. Getting those treatments, having access to those treatments, as Janet has said, access, affordability, and use in the appropriate people is what we want to see, and vaccination. These are incredible tools that we have. Not to mention all the public health and social measures that we have with masks and distancing and ventilation. These are our tools, um, and they work. So we will keep pushing on those, but there's a lot that we can do, and there's a lot that you can do if you're out there for you and for your loved ones. Make sure um, that they're vaccinated, make sure you know what the risk is within your area of the circulation of this virus, um, and make sure you help others. Please also be kind. I have to, I, I cannot emphasize that enough, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of helping people get through this, because you may be living with a vulnerable person. If you see someone wearing a mask on public transport, please don't harass them. <laughs> you know, please support them. You know, we, we will get through this. We will get through this. And there's good research that's ongoing that is helping prevent severe disease. There's good research that's ongoing to help us understand post-COVID-19 condition, but there's just a lot more to do. Thank you so much, Maria. And uh, as, as you rightly said, there's a lot that each of us can do to protect ourselves, protect our loved ones, but above all, really to be supportive and kind to each other, mm -hmm. uh, whether we live with someone who is vulnerable, but also in particular, as, as we've heard from our viewers today, they, they, there are challenges like mm -hmm. with their partners or family members who have been diagnosed with post-COVID condition and uh, are having difficulties themselves to go back to their normal routine mm -hmm. and life. So it is difficult on them, but also on family members. So we need to be more supportive of each other in our communities, but also as uh, citizens of the of the world, Absolutely. as this this pandemic has impacted all of us. Thank you so much for your time and for all your work. And um, I am sure that we will communicate more as we learn about um, uh, long COVID in children. And later on, when you have uh, more webinars towards the end of the year on how health workers can support better patients. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll probably use this this channel as mm -hmm. well to inform public how to seek care and also on all the learning. So thank you to you too. And also I would like to thank to all our viewers watching us from India, Turkey, Colombia, Italy, the US, Iraq, Ghana, Benin, Pakistan, Sweden, Cameroon, Tanzania, Morocco, Burundi, Jordan, where you just came from mm -hmm. this morning, Maria, mm -hmm. Argentina, Austria, Bangladesh, Trinidad and Tobago, so and many more. Uh, so really, thank you for still being with us and, and finding our 
uh, information uh, helpful. We are here to serve everyone and, and do our best. Thank you and goodbye.